Hello, everyone. Welcome to This is CDR. Pleased to have everyone here with us today. Uh, I'm Toby Bryce, uh, normally based in Brooklyn, New York, temporarily Zooming in today from sunny Austin, Texas. Excited to present This is CDR. Um, it's an online event series uh, presented by OpenAir to explore the wide range of carbon dioxide removal solutions currently being researched, developed, and deployed, and to contextualize them for policy proposals we have under development for New York and other states. Um, quick background on open air. We are a distributed volunteer network dedicated to the advancement of carbon dioxide removal solutions essential to solving the climate crisis. Uh, we collaborate on shared open source missions in the areas of policy advocacy and research and development. Please join us. There'll be a link in the chat to our website where there's a form where you can sign up to uh, hop onto our Discord server, which is how we communicate, and we'd love to, to have you. Um, if you haven't already, please introduce yourself in the chat and tell us where you're zooming in from. Before we get started, just a most of you know, but just to define carbon dioxide and removal, um, very specifically carbon that CDR is an activity that removes CO2 from the atmosphere and durably stores it in geological, terrestrial, or ocean reservoirs or in long-lived products. Um, it is not an emissions reduction. It is not a point source carbon capture. It is only uh, removing CO2 from the atmosphere. And when we talk about uh, CDR, it's really important very much up front, first and foremost, to, to clarify that CDR is in no way an alternative to reducing emissions. We as a country, society, world must quickly and completely uh, decarbonize our economy and reduce emissions as uh, quickly and completely as possible, full stop. That said, every credible climate forecast, uh, including most recently in very stark terms, uh, the IPCC report of this past year, um, state that CDR will be required at gigaton scale by mid-century, and that's billions of tons a year. And right now, we are at kiloton scale, thousands of tons. So we have quite a bit of work to do to get to where we need to be. And CDR is going to be required because we're not going to be able to completely and as quickly reduce emissions as, as we would like to zero. Um, some emissions are going to be difficult to abate. Some are going to be inequitable to abate. So we are going to need CDR to compensate for that. Additionally, there's already too much CO2 in the atmosphere. So we're going to need CO CDR to um, take the existing tremendous excess of anthropogenic CO2 out of the air so we can restore our climate to a safer and healthier state. Um, Chris will be putting some uh, links in the chat. There's a lot of great material out there to, to research and learn about CDR, which is why we're here. The, the recordings of all of the, I guess, 15, uh, this is CDRs, are on our YouTube channel. There's a icon right here for the carbon dioxide removal primer, which is a fantastic, basically a textbook on CDR. Um, recently, the DOE has uh, launched a, an earth shot to get CDR down to $100 a ton, which is kind of the magic number, and they have some great resources online. And so plenty of, uh, maybe we'll have a few other links in the chat, but plenty of, plenty of ways to learn about CDR. Also, I just want to give a brief shout out. We had a session just before Thanksgiving premiering um, the legislation we're working on. It's called the Carbon Removal Leadership Act. And basically, it's a state level CDR procurement policy because we're not going to get to gigaton scale purely with the voluntary buyers that have been currently you know, leading the market, the Stripes and Shopify's of the world. Government's going to have to get involved. So this is an effort to do that and provide market support to scale durable CDR. The legislation is standards-based, so it's not directing what CDR needs to be, um, just certain standards in terms of permanence, um, additionality, et cetera. The legislation is very much centered on equity and environmental justice. It's going to be introduced into the New York State Assembly, which we're very excited about, um, by Patricia Fahey, who's a, a very like powerful and amazing assembly member from Albany, and she's very like She's very behind the bill and has been fantastic. We also are working to get the bill introduced in California, Washington, Massachusetts, Colorado, and other states. So hopefully soon a nationwide effort. If you're interested in working on, a, on this with us, we definitely need help on the advocacy front to get local legislators interested in the policy. So please, again, that link that's in the chat to join Open Air, we'd love to have you. Chris uh, is going to hop on now to introduce today's session. Excellent. Pleasure to be here as a uh, guest co-host. Our regular co-host, Mega Raghavan, is off this week. Uh, my name is Chris Neidel. I'm one of the co-founders of Open Air. Uh, I work a lot on our advocacy stuff. I'm a native of upstate New York, uh, based in Brooklyn for a long time, currently living in uh, Costa Rica. So excited today to uh, welcome Josh Santos as our, as our speaker today, the, the visionary co-founder and CEO of Noya. And I'll introduce him in one second. 
Just a little bit of housekeeping notes uh, before we start. Um, we're gonna have Josh speak for 15 to 20 minutes, give a presentation on Noya. Uh, and then this is gonna be followed by some prepared questions uh, that came from our community that Toby will ask. And then we're gonna have audience Q&A, but certainly go ahead and ask your questions as they occur to you during the presentation in the Q&A platform on the bottom of your Zoom screen, not in chat, if you don't mind. And we might even be able to answer some of them uh, as we go, but if you can go ahead and use the Q&A, uh, that would be great. And this is a recorded session, so by either later today or by tomorrow, it will be up on our YouTube channel. So we recommend that you subscribe to that and please share it. And now for the main event, I'm really excited to introduce Josh Santos. Again, he's the co-founder and CEO of Noya. It's a company that's reversing climate change by capturing CO2 from the sky uh, using existing commercial cooling towers, which is incredibly cool. Prior to Noya, Josh was the project manager on the Model 3 program at Tesla, and then the first EV program manager for Harley Davidson. Uh, Josh studied chemical engineering at MIT, and outside of the office, you can find him reading or sailing in the San Francisco Bay, uh, and hopefully we'll have him visiting New York sometime soon too. <laughs> so Josh, go ahead and uh, take it away. Great to have you here. Thanks for the introduction, Chris, and uh, thanks to all the folks from Open Air for having me here today. Super excited to, to be chatting with you all and to share a little bit of what we're doing at Noya and how we are aiming to, uh, to, to impact the amount of CO2 that we have in the sky. <clears throat> so Chris alluded to this already, but uh, you know, fundamentally what Noya is doing is retrofitting cooling towers to perform direct air capture. Now, if you're at all like me, uh, maybe you have never really thought about cooling towers as being this wonderful climate solution. Um, and what I'm excited to share with you all today is a bit about how we came to discover that at Noya, how we're aiming to implement this technology and, and the path that we see moving forward. The climate for me is a very personal, uh, very personal thing. I grew up in the Southeast of the US. I lived in 13 different places before going to MIT for college. And, uh, and, and they all suffer from, from being in hurricane range. And we <laughs> lived through one too many situations where we had to huddle in the closet as storms were hitting us outside. And I saw one too many houses that were missing rooftops the next day. So this is a very, very personal, um, personal, personal thing for me to be working on. So far at Noria, we've been, we've been very, uh, this slide's actually out of date. We, we recently hired a few more folks to the team, but you can see some of our key teams there and some of our key backers. Um, but the key thing I want to draw out to you is that we're a very technical team. I have a degree in chemical engineering. My co-founder is a mechanical engineer by, by education. We got a couple of PhDs in chemistry and chemical engineering, and then a, a chief of staff who comes from us comes to us from the tech world uh, and with some hyper growth startups that's been that's been joining us as well. And we have some amazing backers like Y Combinator, 50 Years, Lower Carbon Capital, and others that are supporting our journey to, to deploy this technology into the world. The key problem that we're that we're finding as we were thinking about how we can how we can retrofit existing cooling towers and incentivize folks to do it is that within commercial real estate, um, there are many sustainable sustainability leaders, whether that's you know, VPs or, or chief sustainability officers or just directors of sustainability or, or you know, at any level, many folks in CRE that are having a real hard time reaching a real net zero. They have taken many different uh, types of actions to get there, whether it's um, installing double pane windows or LED lighting or some type of other energy efficient mechanisms, but they're having a hard time closing, closing the gap between where they're at to achieving a, a true net zero. And a big reason for that is because they, they, weren't, they weren't initially built to run in that way. And so what we're really able to do is we're able to provide them with a solution that is performing, uh, that uses their existing equipment that they have already installed and that's already operating on their facility and turning it into a cooling capture vacuum, uh, a, a, a carbon capture vacuum, so that we can actually use what they already have in their cooling towers to, to capture CO2 from the sky, remove it from the atmosphere permanently, and generate a high quality carbon removal credit that they can use in their own operations. Um, now, if, if, if you've never seen a cooling tower, you can think of it basically as a big box that has a fan that's either on top or at the side, that's pulling in air from the ambient atmosphere. I wanna make a distinction here because a lot of the time when I 
tell people about the cooling tower work that we're doing. They think that the cooling tower itself is emitting CO2 and that there's something being burned inside of it. And that is not at all what's happening. Cooling towers pull in ambient air from the environment, the same air that you and I breathe, and they run it in counterflow with a moving stream of water. They do this to provide industrial scale cooling to a, a process or an HVAC system in the building cases. Um, and and so they, they, you can see in this image as examples, they have uh, uh, water that's running through a heat exchanger and, and then going back to be cold at the cooling tower. So these pieces of equipment are incredibly common. You see them all over the place. There are 2 million in the US. Here's some pictures that we took on top of one of the buildings that has, uh, that has signed onto our wait list so far. On the left, you can see the big fan I was talking about and the air in this specific piece of equipment comes in through the side instead of through the bottom or any other way. So air comes in through the side, it gets ejected out of the top. And this is our chemist, Lorene, and you can see the scale of the piece of equipment here. This on the grand scale of cooling towers is a, I would say about a mid middle of the road size. They get much, much bigger and also much smaller than this. So this is one example that's about smack in the middle and very common for what you might see on top of, a, on top of an industrial building or a commercial building in, in San Francisco like this one is, or in New York City, like we have buildings as well. <clears throat> now the specific way that we're actually uh, you know, we're actually helping our carbon, our, our, our commercial building owners to to bridge the gap on their emissions is is a three step process. The first step is that we we just start out by retrofitting their cooling towers to capture CO two. We've developed we're developing the technology to do that, and I'll dive into more of what that is in a second. <clears throat> we then take the CO two that we generate and we monetize it. We do that in one of two ways. We either uh, remove it from the atmosphere, generate a credit, and then sell that credit, or we directly sell the CO2 that we're producing. And then we take part of the, part of the proceeds, part of the revenue that we, that we collect, and we use that part of the revenue to fund carbon removal on behalf of the companies that own the cooling towers that we're retrofitting. So we get a cheap distributed direct air capture solution, and our partners get free carbon removal credits that they get to use when, when, uh, when, when doing their own carbon accounting. Now, the technology that we're developing, I talked about how it retrofits the cooling tower. And the first step is that the cooling tower has to operate as it normally does. If it does not, that's a showstopper and nobody that we build with will want us there. The first part of a retrofit actually starts by, uh, by redirecting the air it's coming out of the top of a cooling tower. Um, <clears throat> remember from the, the, the animation that I showed you uh, earlier, the air is just kind of flowing out of the top of these pieces of equipment with really nothing to do and nowhere to go. And so we're redirecting that air um, to harness that spent energy and the spent CO2 that's moving through that tower so that we can ultimately capture it. We then run that air that we're redirecting through a piece of equipment that we are developing that, uh, that, <clears throat> that is responsible for the CO2 capture. Within this piece of equipment, we have, a, we have a solid material that we've been working on developing for the past few months that is, uh, that is ultimately um, what, the, what is performing the carbon capture. This material um, is, uh, it, it's, it's a type of material that's found very commonly in, in, in the world, has some research previously to show that it is capable of capturing CO2 and is ultimately what we're using to perform the CO2 capture. <clears throat> this is a, you know, uh, uh, an artistic animation or artistic rendering of what the process may look like. And uh, this is by no means an engineering drawing, but um, you, can, you can get the sense of what we're talking about. Right? We're redirecting the air that's coming out of the top of the tower, pushing it through some equipment that we install alongside the tower and ultimately using that to, to capture CO2. The regeneration of the captured CO2 is done with uh, with with heat and negative pressure to get the CO2 out of the material that we're that we're using to capture CO2, and, um, and and then we store it on site for subsequent pickup and transport. <clears throat> now I talked about the monetization of the of the CO2 that we're producing, and there are a couple of ways that we do that. The first way is we we uh, we sell it directly as a product. 
um, some example markets that we have seen interest in already for the CO2 that we're going to produce are bars, restaurants, and concrete producers as just a handful of folks. Concrete's great because it removes it permanently and it pr provides a, a great monetization strategy, but there are many other types of companies that use CO2 as well. And, um, and with the use of our CO2, we're providing them with a low embodied carbon way to, uh, to, to produce uh, their product using CO2 from the atmosphere. The second and preferable way that we'd like to monetize CO2 is through the, uh, the sale of carbon removal credits. There are a few types of companies that are, or a few types of organizations, I should say, that are doing this right now. Um, tech companies are like Stripe, Shopify, and others are, are one example. And then there are some uh, early compliance markets that are beginning to edge themselves towards um, allowing for carbon removal to be used. LCFS is one that is already there. And then there are others across the country that are that are um, th that are that are getting closer to that to that pathway, and so that's the second and most preferred way that we would like to monetize. But where that's not available, we'll take we'll take the first one. The ultimate goal for us is to get our cost to be as low as possible, as quickly as possible, so that we can scale our process and get get uh, get as much CO two being pulled from the air as we can. And so we will take the strategies that we can to to achieve this ultimately. And then I mentioned that we, you know, we we remove CO two permanently from the atmosphere on behalf of our partners. Um, <clears throat> we we start by, like I've already mentioned, retrofitting the cooling towers on top of commercial buildings. And it's important to note that there are many other types of cooling towers in the country, not just the ones on top of commercial buildings. And we'll look to expand to those in the future. We then transport the captured CO two to regional removal facilities. We are. We are beginning to work with low carbon transportation providers that will allow us to move the CO2 in ways that, um, that, that do not result in large amounts of emissions ending up back in the atmosphere. And so that's something that's really important to us and that we'll always make sure to, to, uh, to ensure we're, we're not doing. And then we permanently remove the captured CO2 using available technologies, right? We're, we're looking at partnering our ways into sequestration and there are a couple of existing pathways like concrete and underground storage that um, that already exist. And so we will look to work with companies that offer these types of services or offer this type of removal so that we can ultimately get the CO2 that we need to out of the sky. Um, now, uh, we, 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 um, we've seen a lot of really great interest from folks that, uh, that, that we've been speaking to about, about what we're doing. We have a, an active pilot site for the first version of our process that's operating in the East San Francisco Bay. And, uh, and then we have about 160 total buildings that are signed on to our, our wait list um, across about 15 uh, US cities. There are some that aren't represented on this map yet. Um, and together our, our signatories, you know, our early LOI signatories have a lot of value tied up in their properties. These are huge multi-billion dollar companies that are excited about the process that we're offering to them. And uh, the excitement is something that we're really excited to be able to service in the future. There are a few ways that uh, if, you're, if you're interested in and have the means to, that uh, we would love your support. Uh, the first is um, we're hiring. It's, so if you or somebody you know is a chemical engineer and expert in logistics and operations, we'd love to talk to them. We have a lot of uh, really, really challenging technical problems to solve about how we can retrofit this wide distributed network of equipment using technologies and, and uh, materials that already exist. So we'd love to, we'd love to get your help in, in, in filling those roles and solving these challenges. Uh, we're looking for spaces to sequester CO2, um, specifically in, in California region. So if you happen to be involved in projects that are looking to do that, we have a lot of CO2 we can provide to you. And I'd love to talk about how we can, how we can help you get that, uh, that supply locked up to ultimately push your project forward. And uh, if you just happen to know a thing or two about compressors, we're currently in the early stages of investigating CO2 compressors for our process. And we'd love to talk to you about, uh, about how we might be able to make a smart decision there. So that was a, that was a bit of a blitz of, of information about what we're doing and the, and the <clears throat> technology that we're developing. My contact information is in the bottom left of the screen here. Feel free to reach out to me directly and I'll drop my LinkedIn in the, uh, in the chat as well. But um, yeah, other than that, appreciate the appreciate the input and the time and really looking forward to answering your questions.
Fantastic. Thank you, Josh. Um, great. Um, we're going to start with a couple of prepared questions and then the audience qu uh, questions are, are streaming in. So audience, please continue to ask questions in the Q&A box. Um, just to start off, uh, can you talk a little bit about how you came to this idea and like, you know, it's, it's a novel idea. So how did it occur to you? Like, what was your sort of entrepreneurial journey? And then maybe second part, how, you know, you worked at Tesla and Harley Davidson. Are there things that you learned in those jobs that have been applicable to you as you've started up, Noya? Yeah, our our journey here has been uh, has been one full of many turns. That is for sure. We when we first started out, our goal our, from the from the very beginning, our goal has been to um, to figure out a a better way to handle the otherwise massive um, capital expenses that are typically involved with with unitary industrial size direct air capture processes. You know, we had some limited data to work off of at the very beginning of our journey that showed that, you know, these types of plants can cost hundreds of millions of dollars and take years to build. And we 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 knew just sort of from from intuition that um, that going down that path in developing an innovative technology would be one that would just take forever. And so instead of doing that, we thought about ways to modularize the the process that we were developing and allow ourselves to get more cycles of learning in per unit time so that we can we can um we can ultimately deploy this technology at a cheaper cost in a much faster period of time so that was sort of the overarching mission that we just sort of landed on i think from from the very beginning uh, our first attempt at this was like an air purifier thing that like you and i would buy and i'd put one in this box behind me and it looks super beautiful and i'd get to talk about how how much i love the environment because i'm i'm pulling co2 out of my box and like that'd be great but the 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 disparate operational costs for how we were looking at that unique solution was not one that we we felt excited about but the underlying technology to how we were forming carbon capture using this type of air purifier is something that we found a home in with cooling towers. We landed on cooling towers initially because my co-founder's dad just happens to own a cooling tower. And my, his dad was like complaining to him about this damned cooling tower that he had that wasn't working well. And, uh, and my co-founder was like, what, what's this cooling tower thing? Can you help me understand it a bit more? And that's kind of how we how we landed on it. Once we realized that this thing does exactly what you need for DAC, it moves a bunch of air and water, and and uh, and then does that in large quantities. So um, that's how we landed on cooling towers ultimately. And I think that my time at Tesla and Harley Davidson has been helpful for for the journey from there because I got to see how how you know big manufacturing operations were scaled well, how they were scaled poorly, and how they were scaled quickly. And, um, and got to pull on some of the experience from an expertise in Harley Davidson as well. They're almost the exact opposite of Tesla in terms of like risk and speed. But, um, but taking the expertise in manufacturing they have combined with the, the speed and, and, and willingness to break through walls from Tesla, I think combines really nicely into the experience of what we're doing at, at Noya. And, and I'm able to pull in my chemical engineering education to, to supplement that as well. That's awesome. Um... You referenced the next two questions are kind of going to drill down into a couple of things you already mentioned. Um, a great friend of open air is uh, Dr. Habib Azarabadi at Arizona State, who works with the father of direct air capture, Klaus Lattner, down there. And he wrote a paper, he and Klaus wrote a paper called Buying Down the Cost of Direct Air Capture that uh, we'll put a link in the chat. Um, and, you know, DAC is all about getting the cost down, as you already kind of emphasized. Uh, but can you maybe give a couple of examples of opportunities with your process for savings and cost reduction? And then maybe also a couple of examples or an example of a bottleneck or an obstacle that's particularly challenging? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we have a lot of, of short-term and long-term um, uh, cost reductions that we're, that we're tracking to at this point. In the short term, there are some. Th there's a lot of room for optimization of our process that we are working towards. We have a lot of different ways in which we can gain additional efficiencies, whether it's through changes in the sorbent or how we manage heat, or the way in which we're we're um, contacting air with our solid material inside of our inside of our equipment. Um, so all of these optimizations are different ways in which we're going to get our costs down in the short term by essentially just making the process easier to run and a more efficient, a more efficient to, to operate. In the long term, since there are 2 million of these pieces of equipment that exist in the world, 
we are looking at a big cost savings through mass manufacturing of individual components that already exist. And so as much as possible, we're going to, you know, we're starting now with, with things that we're designing ourselves because it's just easier for us to do that and, and meet the needs of what we're doing initially. But as we, as we get farther along in the development and understand more about the, the, the ways in which we can optimize our process, we are going to move towards solutions and components that exist in large numbers in the industry today so that we can leverage existing supply chains where possible. Um, those are the types of cost savings that are going to pay back dividends over time and the ones that, uh, that we're really excited about unlocking. In terms of, in terms of bottlenecks or, or specific obstacles, I don't know that, that there's you know, much uh, specifically worth calling out beyond the things that you can probably guess at, like the global supply chain, this and that, and, and COVID, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think that you know, there, there's um, a big uh, potential uh, short-term bottleneck in just getting a wide-ranging uh, set of sequestration solutions that people can use to store atmospherically captured CO2. The widest one that, that is available at this point is concrete. And that's great. And we will use concrete where we can and where, where it makes sense for us to do so. Um, we know that in the, in the long run for us to, to have a confident and, um, and, and uh, near high enough in quantity path for, for sequestration, we're gonna need some stuff to happen underground. The US is starting to get to a place where underground sequestration is, is an offering from different companies for partnerships. And we're seeing examples of companies start to develop their own sequestration wells. And, um, and so that is a problem that will solve itself over time, but at this point is not something that's readily available. And so it, it does limit the potential solution set and, and makes the, uh, the potential economics of a, of a director capture facility like ours a bit, a bit more challenging than we think they will be in the future. Great answer. Thank you so much. Um, the, uh, just want to call out the uh, direct air capture X concrete opportunity. Um, maybe Chris can put a link in the chat. We do have a session coming up led by Chris and uh, also a friend of uh, Open Air Naeem Merchant to drill down into that. But we think that's really a huge opportunity. And as you point out, particularly in North America, like it's really the only place that you can put CO2 at any scale right now. So um, uh, definitely really important opportunity. Um, you also have already talked a lot about uh, modularity. Naeem wrote an excellent blog talking about modularity and direct air capture where he breaks out three types of modularity, um, two of which you referenced, you know, smaller self-contained units versus large unitary industrial scale plants, and then modular plug and play components, ideally that don't require new supply chains. Um, the third one he talked about is modularity of business model. And we're already kind of seeing that in some of the voluntary markets where some of the buyers are starting to separate out capture and store storage um, in terms of their crediting or purchase. Um, there's another piece of it too, which is uh, transport. And you guys, uh, per one of your slides, you're looking to handle the transport yourselves. Um, another really interesting company also funded by uh, Lower Carbon that is not a uh, carbon removal company, but an emissions avoidance company called Remora that's doing the uh, point source capture of emissions for tractor trailer trucks, they're kind of doing the same thing. Do you see, do you see individual companies developing their own um, CO2 transport solutions? Or do you think that either one of you guys will be super successful at it and serve other companies, or maybe an independent player will come out and like have the, the, the economical scale solution for handling CO2 transport? I mean, obviously it'll be pipelines in certain instances, but particularly in an urban environment, a distributed urban environment, you're probably gonna need trucks or you know something. So like, how do you see that working? Cause it seems like kind of a missing, a, a little bit of a gap in terms of the solution currently. Yeah, I mean, when we look at, there are two things that I think about when I think about transport. The first is how we do CO2 transport today. And the second is how we will likely do CO2 transport in the future. Today, when we're moving CO2 around, there are two ways we do it, right? Or three ways we do it. We do it on truck, rail, or pipeline. Um, and if you live in a dense urban environment like, like I do here in San Francisco, I see these, you know, they almost look like, uh, if you can imagine like a, a a, a toy truck that a kid might have like one of those like Tonka trucks that has like the the the, the like mining scoop background um, <clears throat> they have trucks like that for moving cryogenic co2 around they're much smaller than what you would picture a, a large tanker truck to be and so they're much easier to actually get around dense environments and um, 
And so companies are doing that now, today, that, that those pieces of equipment you can buy um, and, and, uh, and those exist. So we are currently planning on doing that ourselves because there isn't currently a service provider that offers that type of, that type of service for, for transport. There are service providers today that offer freight transport and lots of companies like JB Hunt, YRC, and others can help you move boxes around, but there aren't really any companies to help you move CO2 around that we know of. And if you do have one, well, I'd love to know about it and talk to you about it. That'd be great. But um, but we haven't found one yet. Um, so that's sort of the state of the state of the state of the industry today, and why we're thinking about it in the way that we are. Think about it in the future, though, where we're essentially have a carbon. Uh, carbon removal industry that is the size of the oil and gas industry and the oil and gas industry is, is um, you might say pretty fragmented in terms of like how they approach different areas of this uh, of the of the overall value stream of petroleum when it comes out of the ground right there's a company that that um, actually provides the service of setting up your well there are many of these Schlumberger Halliburton are a couple I interned at one and, and that was a whole special experience uh, but but they provide that very niche service and they're a huge company um, as one of their many services and then there are companies that process the petroleum and companies that that then sell it to the end consumer and many others that I'm skipping over but um, but there is specialization amongst companies and those companies that are specialized are incredibly large and so I, I picture a future industry that is like this where all of the needs of everything that we're doing or everything that we need have 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 materialized in ways that you know people have built companies off off of them, and um, and so that's something I'm really excited to to happen. At this point, just given how new the industry is, we haven't yet reached that point. But if you're an excited entrepreneur that wants to get into the space, I would think about the the picks and shovels for carbon removal and how we might be able to to address some of these needs because they are real problems. And, and, you know, my other, my only solution at this point is to buy trucks and maybe that's the right thing to do in the long term, but uh, damn sure doesn't feel like the right thing to do right now. Yeah. No, it's, it's great. I think it's great advice too, to all the company builders in the audience. I do feel like there's a huge gap there in the, the sort of logistics and transport for the CDR industry um, as it scales. Um, last question from open air. Um, you talked a lot about your, you know, your current set of potential buyers, um, and we mentioned this uh, Carbon Removal Leadership Act earlier in the program, which is a public government procurement program for um, CDR, as distinct from a compliance mechanism like a low carbon fuel standard in California, which is requiring, it's a regulatory market that requires the emitters to actually buy the CO2, um, and we are big fans of procurement for a couple of different reasons, but could you just talk a little bit about what kind of impact do you think that sort of policy could have on a company like Noya in the DAC space and more generally on the CDR sector? Um, we think the policy uh, is extensible to any state in North America and other, you know, other jurisdictions internationally and even at the municipality level. So we think it kind of has scale potential as a policy. And so given if it does proliferate, what do you think are some of the key attributes and factors to make that policy successful for the supply side of the CDR market and as impactful as possible? The biggest thing that the, that it, uh, the supply side of the market needs is a demand side. And so if we can implement policy that is done intelligently, that provides a um, consistent and you know, as predictable as you can with these things, uh, predictable demand for carbon removal, then that unlocks the, um, the, the flow of capital to then build more of these projects. Because from a, from an investor standpoint, which is where I would go if I wanted to to you know raise the money to to build these pieces of equipment in San Francisco and New York City, the you know there's a big risk in the uh, you know the monetization of what we're providing as a service, and um, and you know in the short term, as I mentioned, we're thinking about de-risking that with just commercial CO two sales in in dense urban markets that are otherwise hard to service and can be expensive for local business owners. And, um, and in the long run, when we're producing a lot of CO2, we're gonna need a better way to, to offload that and especially a better way to, to offload the, the removals credits that we're going to be generating. And that's where policy can step in and have a real influence on the work that we and other carbon removal companies are doing um, by providing that, that you know, guaranteed uh, that guaranteed demand, we can essentially say, if I build this project and generate this revenue, then you will see this return investor. And therefore, 
we should we should we should do business together. I should, I should get your your investment, and we should go build some projects. So, the the policy side for procurement is incredibly important and can be a huge accelerant for us and for other companies that are doing the same kind of work. Good to hear. Um, I'm gonna see if uh, Chris can materialize here because it looks like we have many many audience questions. People are super excited about this. So, Chris, you want to take that away? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Great. We we have a lot of questions. Um, what I'll probably do is just start with some technical questions from the, the most general to some more complicated, uh, more science and engineering questions, and then we can hop over to the more commercial business related questions. So one of them, you, you brought this up, obviously, Josh, in your presentation, but maybe you could just put a fine point on it. Um, the cooling tower thing is what people are obviously really interested in, including myself. Um, can you just again restate what it is about cooling towers that makes them um, a useful or you know, important piece of infrastructure to leverage here? Yeah, definitely. We've we've uh, in our development so far have have designed two different processes that can use cooling towers. The first uses the fact that inside of cooling towers there's an air to water contact, and we leveraged that by adding a blend of carbon capture chemicals directly into the water that cooling towers are already using. And so we essentially had this distributed network of air contactors that we were using to capture CO2 from the sky. And the technology works. That's what the pilot that we have in the East Bay, it's, it's running that process. And, um, and, and we could go and, and scale that massively at this point. The problem with this is that um, water, as we who have, you know, as anybody who's like watched a kettle boil on the stovetop is a hard thing to heat up. And while the solvents that we're using do regenerate at you know, relatively low temperatures around 100 to 150 degrees centigrade is where they regenerate the capture of CO2, they, um, the, you still have to create that energy somehow. Um, and there are some operations, uh, some sites that we could retrofit where that heat may be available in the form of waste heat, waste steam and that sort of thing. And where that's available, we will take advantage of that and use it to lower the cost of regeneration. It's not always available. And so when that heat needs to be generated ourselves, it becomes a, a, uh, a bit of an expensive process to, to operate. And so that one we, we have done, we can do where there's high heat availability and, uh, and we can get cheap CO2 from it. Second process, and, and what, what the reason cooling towers are relevant to the second process is because the sorbent that we're using within the equipment that we install requires the presence of some water to perform the CO2 capture. So it's needed from the chemistry perspective of things, uh, the water is, and cooling towers are great sources of humid water. And they exist and they move lots of air. And so we are retrofitting them in that way to, to capture CO2. Great. Um, and obviously what's beautiful about that is that cooling towers are sort of a universal distributed piece of infrastructure that you're leveraging. Um, there are a couple of questions about other types of infrastructure uh, that might be able to be used as a similar basis beyond cooling towers. I didn't know if there's anything in the works or on the horizon that expands beyond cooling towers. Lots of ideas and uh, and we'd love to we'd love to work on all of them. At this point, we're focused on servicing cooling towers because there are a lot of them they tend to be fairly sizable in the amount of air that they're moving and therefore the amount of CO2 that can be produced from them. And, uh, and the people who own them, the you know, building owners and factory owners and, and heavy industrial operators of the world are currently seeing the writing on the wall for, um, for the need to decarbonize. And so we can go and help them do that and, and help them solve a problem that they have. So there's a nice, uh, intermingling of a few different things with cooling towers that we'll uh, focus on for you know for for some time, but beyond that, we have lots of ideas and uh, and would love to would love to talk about those with folks that are that are interested in them. Great, and then there's uh, some questions here just about more specifically quantifying the the actual CO two drawdown uh, from an average building. So that was one question. The question from Paul. Uh, if you can give us a sense of what the CO2 removal will be from an average commercial building. And then related, Ethan asks, you know, do you have a CO2 removal metric to estimate the scale capacity for any given system? Uh, so kg of CO2 per year per CFM of cooling tower airflow. Yeah, yeah. So we, based on the folks we've spoken to already, estimate that an average commercial building's cooling tower might be capable of, of removing, you know, a max of couple of tons a day of CO2 from the air. 
based on just the large amount of air that's moving through the system. I mean, you remember the image I showed earlier, those are really big fans that we're talking about. So they're moving a lot of air and, and, um, and that's the, the sort of max from there. Currently our technology is, uh, can capture about half of that. We're looking at increasing that percentage of first pass capture, obviously, but that's kind of where we're at now. Um, so that's, that's sort of like an average tower and they get, like I said, much smaller and much, much, uh, much bigger as well. Um, from a from an average uh, sort of like uh, carbon removal metric, we we estimate that per um, co cooling towers are typically talked about in units of like tonnage of cooling. Tonnage of cooling is a really antiquated unit that comes from the days when we didn't have AC and we cooled our house and we cooled our, our everything in our homes with literal blocks of ice, like tons of ice. And so people would go around in trucks and like appraise how many tons of ice would be required to cool your house. That's where the tonnage unit comes from. Super fascinating that we still use that. And, uh, and per ton of cooling capacity for a cooling tower, we estimate that there is around, uh, around six kilograms or so of CO2 that, that could be captured. Great. And Jeremy Overman, if I could ask, I accidentally just deleted one of your technical questions about cooling towers. So if you can restate that, I'll ask Josh later. It was about an alternate use of fluid. Uh, it looked like an interesting engineer to engineer type question. Um, so just some of the, a couple of the just last questions about the actual cooling tower. You kind of just answered it, but it sounds like your techno, there's obviously a range of different types of cooling towers. So it's not really a one size fits all solution. Uh, you, the nature of technology allows it to sort of integrate with a host of different types of cooling towers and different sizes, is that correct? Yeah, exactly. There's, um, we're, we're thinking about the development in two separate parts. Uh, one part is the, um, the equipment that contains the carbon capture material itself. This equipment will be able to be fairly standardized across many different applications of cooling towers because really all it takes is input air as and and uh, and so long as we feed it the input air in the same way, then we will be able to standardize that across all of our all of our future buildings. Um, and then the second part of the design is the integration with the cooling tower. On this part, there will be many options, uh, many standardized options that we will have available based on the range of cooling towers that we're retrofitting. What we found is that amongst cooling towers as a as like an entire uh, segment of equipment, if you will, right? All the cooling towers in existence, there's a wide variance. Across cooling towers um, in specific industries, the variance gets much smaller. And so if we're servicing commercial real estate buildings to start, we will have to design for a smaller set of potential um, applications than if we were going out and building at commercial properties and refineries and mining sites and nuclear, you know, all of those would be, that'd be a lot but focusing on one to start and then kind of expanding from there allows us to get the repeatability and modularity that the, that the process will ultimately offer. Great, and this is the last uh, technical uh, water tower question. Uh, there's a couple of them from Jeremy that just, and I've seen this as a solar person, there's a lot of stuff up on a roof. And when you use that, there's always risks potentially of damage or underperformance of, those, of that equipment. So is there anything you can say about the integration with the cooling tower? Are there any risks of, uh, impeding or reducing the performance or efficiency of the cooling tower, any damage risks, and how do you sort of deal with that, if so, as a business, uh, you know, for a property owner? Yeah, that that is the single biggest uh, technical challenge that our team is working on solving right now is exactly this one. Um, there is a brute force short-term solution that we will implement that will essentially just add a small inline blower to add a small amount of energy back into the system and help move the air along at the same path in which it initially was. And in parallel to that, we're investigating different types of not just aerodynamic designs, but also just overall embodiments of the system that will allow us to take advantage of what the system was initially designed to do while also allowing us to tap into that energy that cooling towers are utilizing to, to, to move a bunch of air and therefore move a bunch of air through our system. And we're looking at not just different types of equipment design, but also just different ways to approach the air to solid contact. And, um, and, and one of the biggest overarching metrics in the success of each of these potential solutions is 
impact to impact to, to to airflow through the cooling tower. So that's the big challenge that we have ahead of us, and absolutely something that we're that we're keeping a close eye on. And it's something that we will not scale with building owners unless we we have their belief in in our ability to maintain equipment performance. Yeah. Great. Well, we have a lot of questions here that fall under, I guess, the sort of commercialization. You gave us a feature. You're a new company, one with a really novel idea here that's clearly resonated. It sounds like you have a lot of people uh, calling and emailing you. Can you tell us a little bit more about what the next year looks like for you uh, in terms of commercialization, in terms of capacity? And also, we're a global audience here, but a lot of New Yorkers. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about interest that you're seeing in New York, uh, particularly with some of our climate policies on the book, like Local Line 87, which would seem to, you know, really create an incentive for, for noise technology. Yeah, yeah, we have been fortunate to see a lot of interest from, from commercial real estate folks and, and just people that own cooling towers generally. I think the idea of using such a, um, you know, a, a, a standard, like kind of not thought about that much piece of equipment to, to do good and, and help the business is one that that has resonated with people definitely. Um, in the next year, our big our big milestone is to build the first large scale pilot of the second version of our process. I mentioned we have one already of the of the first version that we developed. That's the aqueous based process that uses chem, carbon, carbon capture chemicals to pull CO two from the sky. We've done that. That exists. Uh, so the next milestone ahead of us is to build a pilot of the second version of our process and that we are aiming to do by late next year with eyes to scale in San Francisco and New York after that in early 2023. Um, we've seen we've seen interest from all over the place, but there's been a ton in New York City, and I think it's specifically because of local law 97. Um, we've seen lots of building owners trying to figure out ways to to meet the requirements of what the law states they they need to do and uh, and where you know we we know that we'll be able to help them the sticking point just comes in like the words that are written down in in the actual law itself the local law 97 currently allows for 10 percent of greenhouse gas emissions for a building to be offset through offsets there isn't much specificity around what that looks like we were recently selected as one of the winners of the New York City Department of Buildings Hack the Building Code competition. And our platform was in allowing local New York City workers to locally generate their own carbon removal offsets um, and, and offsets that are high quality, highly permanent. They're not these forestry projects that we know about. They're not the, the, the biochars of the world. We need all those and those are great. I'm not, I'm not ragging on those, but what I'm saying is that what the law exists to do is really to decarbonize New York, right? New York has these lofty, uh, climate goals, and so we 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 the law exists to do that, and uh, and we were selected as winners because I think there's a lot of resonance with the idea of locally producing carbon removals to essentially allow New York City to reap some of the benefits of this fast growing and all important field. So that's how we view I think commercialization over the next twelve months. We've seen a lot of interest in New York City, uh, both from the from you know the the private sector and building owners, and also from people that that are in the public sector as well. So we hope to work closer with both of those groups over the coming months and, and years to, to, to figure out a way to allow New York City to reach that goal. Great. Well, there's, there's also some questions. These are really questions about scale potential, uh, but from a, a cooling tower point of view. And so Irene uh, sort of asked the question, you know, help us understand how prevalent cooling towers that can use your technology are in New York, but if you could also just sort of globalize this. And I guess that's sort of the answer to Bjorn's question around what is the, the future scale potential you really have as a company. Um, so if you could give us a, help us size that up in our heads a little bit, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. New York State is uh, one of my favorites in that it is one of the few, it might be the only one in the country actually, that maintains a public database of cooling towers in the entire state. So you can go, you can Google New York State cooling tower database and find this uh, online. And uh, if you filter down from the you know, thousands that are in the state to what's in New York City alone, <clears throat> the five boroughs of New York City are home to about 6,300 cooling towers. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not thought about because they're typically just scattered across rooftops. But if you were to go onto Google Earth and sort of zoom around Manhattan or Brooklyn or Queens, you'd see them all over the place. They'd be, they'd be everywhere. If essentially anywhere where you see a big fan is very likely a cooling tower. So. 
Uh, they're very prevalent in, in New York and they're very prevalent all over the country as well. Um, NSF and some other folks did a study and estimated that there are 2 million active cooling towers in the country alone. And using some of the metrics that we've gathered across different sizes that cooling towers may come in and the associated airflows with those sizes, we estimate that cooling towers across the country move around 10 billion tons of CO2 per year. In New York City specifically, that number ranges from around three to 11 million tons per year. And, um, and so the scale potential for this technology is massive because the US as a, as a point of comparison emits about 6.8 billion tons of CO2 equivalent each year. And so, um, and so using cooling towers in the US, you can take out a sizable chunk of that amount of emissions. That's great. Just another sort of New York question here, is, as we talk a lot about on this series, you know, it's fair to say New York State has really, um, you know, taken a real lead, I think, in taking carbon tech seriously and trying to attract this new growing sector to the state. And one of the key actors behind that is the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, which has multiple programs that are really targeting this and trying to lure companies like yours and your customers into the state. And one question did come from Heather, actually, and she's talking about the nice sort of retrofit New York program. And um, yeah, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but I guess this is a, kind of a more general question is like, how linked in is Noya right now with some of the state programs that are focused more broadly on climate tech, but spe specifically on carbon tech? Yeah, I would say not not very much at all. So Heather would love to learn more about this this program. Sounds fascinating. And uh and would love to would love to learn more about it and any other New York State programs that may be may be relevant if, if they exist. I would say New York State has been impressive to watch because it is definitely one of the leaders, if not the leader in the country, for the amount of effort and energy and capital and resources that it's putting into this problem. So really cool to to see. Absolutely. And if you could give a little bit more information, there's some questions. There's a lot of people that are asking, how do I get Noya on my building? So we put uh, you know, I'm sure you have an inbox and a form, uh, you know, if there's anything you can add to people's expectations, let's just say new, on both coasts about what they would do to try to get on the list uh, would, would be great. Um, let's let's go ahead and start there. Yeah, yeah, we we do have a form. It's on our website. Uh, you can you can visit us at noia.co and uh, submit a form to schedule an initial consultation. We have um we have a big wait list, as I talked about a bit earlier, but would love to ensure that we get your building onto the list as quickly as possible. And we work to include your specific building's considerations into our early design as early as we can. So I would say those two reasons are, are hopefully reason enough to, to reach out to us there. And my email as well, you can, you can contact me or you can contact uh, other folks in the company at hello, dot, at, hello at noia.co. Great. I want to give you a little feedback from two of our excellent open air members, Irene and Andrew, are saying you should lead with that huge number of cooling towers uh, <laughs> in your communications because it is a pretty staggering number that gives people an immediate sense of scale and the immediacy of it since there's, they're, they're right in our midst, cooling towers. Um, just some questions on your pricing model and, and costing. Uh, you, you alluded to it a little bit in your presentation, but is there anything you can tell us about what is your business model? Do, do you own the asset and it's a service-based model or... If you can give us a little bit of sense of that and what the costs are for the customer. Yeah, uh, so the model is exactly what you just said. We cover the cost of installing the asset and then own and operate that asset. We, um, we compensate the building owner for any incremental operating expenses that they see due to running our process. And uh, their building sees, excuse me, due to running our process. And, uh, and then we take that CO2 and we monetize it. And then we... Um, we we pay the we pay the building owner back in in carbon removal credits. We initially started by paying the building owner back in cash, and people told us that they wanted carbon removal credits more. So, um, so that's what we're providing them instead, and and what we're looking to move forward with. Right, and just a couple of what the first question that came actually was from Gideon, uh, which is an interesting one. It has to do with sort of alternate revenue streams and financing. Um, but have you considered any blockchain solutions for opening up investment opportunities, perhaps by tokenizing kilograms of carbon captured, which is an idea that's been discussed with an open air. And it's a pretty cool one. Uh, we have not put much thought into that, but would love to, would love to, um, you know, everything about the decentralized movement that's happening uh, on the internet <laughs> is something that's really, really cool to, to watch and see. And, 
you know, we'd love to think about how to incorporate some of that into what we're doing. Right now, we've been heads down on the raw, uh, you know, sort of like chemical engineering, mechanical engineering side of things. Um, but there's a whole world of different financing solutions that is available to us to, to take advantage of. Great. And just, just one question, you might have time for two, but just one that came in from Melanie, uh, just some clarity on the carbon credit revenue. And she really has a question here about the difference between removals and more circular applications for fuel for soda. Um, mm -hmm. How does that work for you guys in terms of as a revenue stream? Are you only collecting revenue from, uh, from removals or if you have a sort of a beneficial use uh, that has a lower carbon compared to a uh, incumbent, are you also getting carbon uh, climate rev carbon revenue from that? We're only in the business of generating revenue through carbon removals. And so we're not looking at, at ever uh, generating any sort of carbon avoidance or carbon reduction credits and then selling those. We believe that carbon removal credits are the highest quality ones that, uh, that, that should exist. And they're really the only ones that, that I think are, can have the impact on decarbonizing the atmosphere that we need as a, as a global species. And so we will only choose one or the other. If we're monetizing CO2 through any circular applications or, or utilization applications, um, we likely will just recognize revenue through the sale of the CO2 itself. If we're removing CO2 and then generating a carbon removal credit, then we'll recognize revenue from that credit itself. We will not do both because that will essentially be double counting and everybody knows that is, uh, that is to be avoided at all costs. Gotcha. And I just real quick thing, Rocco and a few other people were inquiring about potential partnerships, uh, I, both on the real estate side, but also with other CDR companies to diversitize CO2 storage. So I would imagine they should imagine they should reach out to you just via your website if they want to um, talk to you about potential collaboration ideas. Uh, the last thing I want to ask, too, is a lot of the states that are very forward on climate and climate policy, which is pushing um, demand for, for companies like your own. Um, are also at the tip of the spear in terms of uh, marijuana legalization. And you and I have discussed before about a potential interesting integration between direct air capture that's modular and uh, the cannabis cultivation industry, which, which can use beneficially CO2. Can you tell us a little bit about that intersection potentially with Noya? Is that a segment that you're, you're really looking at? Yeah, it's something that I think we're really excited about, not just, not just the cannabis industry, but also any sort of indoor agriculture industry that that is that is coming up. I mean, plants need CO2 to grow. And when you put a bunch of plants inside, then you have to add in CO2 so they can they can have enough to breathe and grow. And so every almost every indoor vertical vertical farming company requires CO2 as an input. Marijuana is one, but any other company that's growing, you know, any sort of greens also requires that CO2. And what's nice about that is that they typically um, you know, they, they are fairly flexible on source, they're fairly flexible on, on feedstock purity, so long as you're not injecting, you know, toxic, noxic chemicals into their, into their air. So they're a really, a really exciting one for us to think about at the, at the early stages. Great. Well, as always, I go over. Uh, we had some questions we weren't able to reach, but we can continue the conversation in Open Air's Discord. Uh, but that was fantastic, Josh. I'm just going to hand it over to uh, Toby, who will close this out. Yeah, thank you so much, Josh. That was amazing. And thank to the audience for joining us and for so many great questions. Um, we have, I'm gonna put a slide up with what we have upcoming. Um, one second here. Next week we have Sea Change, which is a really cool um, electrochemical ocean CDR solution out of UCLA. Um, they are a recent purchase from Stripe and uh, they are going to present. And then on the 14th, we have another ocean CDR solution, planetary hydrogen, which is carbon negative hydrogen out of Nova Scotia. And then uh, we are probably going to be quiet for the rest of the month for the holiday. And then early uh, 2022, we have uh, Chris coming back with Naeem Merchant to tell us about DAC and concrete and how that can um, result in CDR. Um, thank you again. We're going to leave the chat up for a couple minutes so you can collect any of the links there. There are links to um, Josh and Noya's Twitter. And there are links to Open Air's Twitter and website, et cetera. Um, thank you again. Everyone have a great week, and we will see you next Tuesday. Yeah.